to uh, the Sired Santa Fe event. Um, my name is Morgan Barnard. Uh, I'm a member of Sired Santa Fe and doing this talk tonight with Mir Barak. We're really excited to be in conversation about our work and um, celebrate the solstice, the winter solstice, and also the launch of my uh, window box piece that's outside. Afterwards, we'll go out and, and view the piece. Um, so we'll, um, I'm gonna kind of start off just by talking about Sired Santa Fe, and then we will each give a short presentation, and then um, we're gonna ask to each other some questions, and then we're gonna uh, open up the floor uh, for questions. Um, and so, um, Sired Santa Fe is an organization here in Santa Fe that is interested in the intersection of art and science. Um, there are um, members that are artists, there are members that are scientists. We, we have several of the members here today, Susan Latham, uh, Shirley Crow, to name a few, I think there's some others. Um, and these laser events we do, oh, uh, this is the website. If you want to uh, sign up for the email list for future events, um, you can go to sciartsantafe.org and you can sign up there. Um, the event we're doing tonight is a, is a laser uh, talk, which is Leonardo Art and Science Evening Rendezvous. And this is um, part of uh, MIT. Um, the Leonardo uh, Laser Talks is international gathering. It happens um, all over the world uh, and Sciart Santa Fe yeah, is the Santa Fe has a Santa Fe chapter where we uh, give give talks on a regular basis, um, and the mission is to encourage uh, the contribution to the cultural environment of of a region by fostering dialogue. And so that's what we're doing tonight. We're going to be in conversation and have a dialogue about how our work uh, intersects with some of these ideas. Um, so Sired Santa Fe supports the powerful exchange of ideas between the arts, sciences, and technology. That's the mission. And so we look for ways to bring people together to share those ideas. Um, and this is in the form of uh, different, different things. Um, strategies, you know, the monthly gatherings of um, Sired practitioners. So we had a gathering at the beginning of the month here in this room, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and then uh, at least four public laser events a year. Uh, and we've been doing that for the past several years now. And then at least one public exhibition a year. And we have recordings of the lasers uh, on a YouTube channel um, and other Sired Santa Fe events. And also a newsletter where we, we talk about what members are doing and share out um, what we're up to. And these are some of the events we've had uh, recently. You can see there's uh, quite a lot of events uh, just in this last year. Laser events, um, both here in Los Alamos and in Albuquerque. And um, you know we're looking towards 2024 <coughs> to host a lot more exciting events. Um, Andrea Poli um, is, uh, helped start this uh, Sired Santa Fe. Um, in conjunction um, um, with Susan Latham and other folks that were really interested in furthering this dialogue between art and science and coming out of um, various um, other things that have happened in Santa Fe, the, was it the Santa Fe Complex, is that right, Susan? Yes. The Santa Fe Complex mm -hmm. and um, kind of bringing people together that were interested in furthering these discussions. And so it's been, um, really great to see this grow over the past several years. And Andrea is in Portugal on an artist uh, residency right now on a, on a project so she can't uh, join us um, today. Um, and I, I know Andrea from uh, many years ago in New York and um, you know her sort of, uh, her work and her vision of how she works with environmental data and sound and sonification has always been something that's really inspired me. And, and she's been a, a great um, source of inspiration and we've had the opportunity to collaborate together on several projects. So um, thinking of Andrea and um, the work that she's done to get us all this far. Um, and so, um, and I'll sit down for this part. Um, okay, sorry, okay. So, um, so yeah, so tonight we're gonna have this conversation 
uh, encountering the unseen is the kind of theme that we that, that we decided on for this. And um, I'm going to start out talking about uh, my window box project, um, and we'll show a short video um, uh, that the museum um, commissioned by Mountain Mover Media, which was really, I'm really excited about this video. It's really cool. I'll show that closer to the end. But um, I'm going to talk about um, the window box and sort of how I got to um, uh, be involved in the window box and then how I decided what to do with the window box and how my practice sort of led me to this, this project that's opening. So um, the window box uh, project is a collaboration between the New Mexico Museum of Art and Vital Spaces. Uh, Vital Spaces is a organization here in town that provides um, uh, subsidized um, uh, art studios. Uh, they work with various um, uh, uh, landowners, um, property owners, and they turn over spaces to artists. Um, I've been in the annex to the um, the library in the Midtown campus um, for the past three years. And that's been an amazing place to just kind of experiment, have a kind of white cube to, to, uh, to play with, to try things out, to, uh, it's really been an experimental lab for me. And it's really pushed me into a lot of new directions that um, are really are sort of culminating in this window box project. And so um, I, uh, a couple years ago, I did a, a you know, streaming um, uh, audiovisual presentation for the current New Media Festival when they were partially online. Um, so it's really been a place to just explore and try out, uh, try out new ideas. And some of these ideas uh, have kind of um, uh, drawn me to this Lumia light medium that I've been exploring for the past uh, several years. It's, um, it's, a, it's, it's an old medium. Um, Thomas Wilfred in the early, um, in, the, in the 1920s was really looking at creating a new light art medium um, using caustics, reflection, um, motors, creating these kind of durational pieces that um, were not fixed. They would um, have sort of, you know, maybe a several month duration um, as, as part, of, part of the work. And kind of thinking in these larger time scales and thinking about how, um, how audio interacts with these. Uh, he did a lot of um, sort of music accompaniment to these, these light shows. And, and I've sort of uh, been looking at these, this way of working um, and bring in kind of a more, a more modern um, technology um, into it using um, LEDs and microcontrollers um, and also incorporating data um, about the natural world. Um, a large part of my practice is using um, weather, weather data uh, in different ways and environmental data and trying to create an experience through light to um, kind of communicate some of these ideas. So um, the past several years I've been, you know, in my studio kind of working with this medium on a smaller scale, kind of um, 12 inch by 12 inch, 8 inch by 8 inch. Um, and uh, I have a few of them on display right now over at um, Forming Concept in a show that they have over there, uh, some of the smaller boxes that I've been working on um, over the years. And working at that small scale has been um, been really interesting um, to work in and here's some, you know, kind of experiments in the studio, uh, kind of playing around with, you know, incorporating uh, this as a source for other video type things. Uh, I just really wanted to connect back to the vital spaces um, in this because it's really uh, given me this flexibility to create these kinds of works and uh, have this connection to, to uh, working with materials in different ways. Um, and this piece here was um, I made uh, last year called Saturation Point. And this piece is, uh, it's an eight, 
uh, like eight inch by eight inch light box. And it's really, you know, kind of tapping into this fascination with the skies and clouds of New Mexico and thinking about um, the weather and how, and how it, and you know, how we experience it. So this piece took um, uh, three different um, average monthly data points from New Mexico. It took temperature, precipitation, and wind speeds from uh, the year 2021. Um, and so it was just this kind of average data and the, um, uh, each one is assigned a color and then these colors kind of mix together and create this sort of animated, um, this animated piece. And it's, it has a generative quality to it where it never repeats. It's never, it's not a loop. It's sort of always changing and creating new ways of, um, it's a, a new appearance all the time. And the components that are, um, you know, part of this are, are really, you know, a diffusion layer, a screen, um, reflective materials, and in this case, um, LEDs and a microcontroller with all this data embedded within it. And, um, and so this, this piece um, was really kind of the jumping off point for me um, thinking about the window box, and I'll talk a little bit more about how, um, about how that uh, connection came together. Um, but I've had the opportunity to kind of, you know, take, take some of this work and not quite a light box, but playing with some of these ideas in a public setting. This was at um, Pi Projects um, uh, during a time when they were closed. Um, and this piece here is, um, a, it is an audio-based piece. It's an audio-reactive piece. So I, I, I tend to use audio, um, create music. I've been making music for a long time. I you know, grew up playing saxophone and uh, played a lot of uh, jazz, experimental music, and been making more electronic music in, in the, the recent years. And so um, that's always this kind of uh, interplay with data, like I kind of see music as data for visual experiences, much like I see weather for visual experiences. So this piece was driven by um, a generative sound score. And so uh, the, the colors, the animated colors are all driven by, um, by the music. And so it's ever changing. Again, it's not, a, it's not a loop, it's always in flux. This is a temporary piece that um, ran for just a, a few weeks in, uh, at, at the Pi Projects Gallery. Um, and this is uh, just a little example of just, uh, as I was developing um, the piece for the window box, um, you know, I really decided to blow up the small light boxes. Um, the space um, for the window box is almost the same proportions as the small boxes. And I saw an opportunity there to really try and go big. And having the Vital Spaces Studio really allowed me to um, experiment and try things out. So this is, I think before I had the weather data going, the, the live weather data, I um, was kind of just using music and, and feeding that in. Um, and so there's just some kind of like weird music in the background here, but, um, but you can just kind of see a little bit of how the studio uh, can become a, an experimental sort of lab. <coughs> and so here it's sort of an audio reactive thing happening, um, but you know, starting to, to play around with how I'm working with materials and the and, um, uh, projection. And that was one big thing that changed with um, my approach for this project is rather than using LEDs, um, I'm incorporating projection in, into the work. So um, there's a uh, projector behind here, whoops, that is um, uh, projecting a generated a generative animation onto um, reflective mylar and then casting uh, the lights out into the space. Whoops, uh, go to the next slide. Okay, 
So this is the, the window box, um, and um, you can see the, the alcove um, section um, over there up in the top is really just uh, this opportunity to build out um, a window box. And so um, that's pretty much what I did. I just um, decided to um, uh, take some of the principles and ideas that I, I learned on the small scale boxes and then blow it up to a large space. And I've, I've worked in public space a lot um, as, uh, as a public artist on large collaborative projects, uh, working uh, with data sets, uh, a, a river in Portland. Um, there's a bridge, a new bridge, where the river data controls the lighting. Um, and so there's something about working in a public facing space like this that has always really excited me. And so, um, so this opportunity was, was really great to try and find a way to work with this space and the conditions and, and create, um, create a piece. And so these are some early like um, visualizations that I did, uh, just kind of started to think about the space and how to mock it up and, and how I might um, go about um, working with this uh, location. And this work is very light sensitive and it's kind of, it's been a, uh, you know, an interesting struggle of how it operates um, in the daytime and, um, and at, at nighttime, you know, it's more, it's much more active at night on a cloudy day. You can definitely see some effect on the really sunny days. It's a little, uh, it's a little trickier. Um, but there's a, a couple components here that um, I just want to talk about really quick. Um, in a lot of my, the light boxes that I make, there's some kind of an aperture that controls the light from the reflective materials to the screen. And so as I was thinking of what to do in the window box I, and working with weather data, I wanted to create this kind of um, almost living connection between the weather and, um, and the display in the box to kind of really positioning the weather and the environment as an actor. So one of the components in there is this large scale articulated um, iris mechanism. And um, this is controlled by the light levels. So as the, um, as uh, the, when, it's, when it's brighter out, it constricts down to a smaller opening. And then um, at night, it opens up, much like how our eyes operate. And just really thinking of this kind of interface between the public, the outside, and the inside, um, and how the pupil works in our own eyes, and kind of creating a connection between those those things. Um, just a little kind of uh, bit on um, the how this all all works. So there's a little weather station on the roof, and it brings in um, data, and then. It controls the iris, and then it also controls this animation. And, um, and then that is projected onto the, um, the window film. And there's projection, and there's also um, some LED lights that are part of it. Um, I was going to say something about this, but this is just interesting. So I, I, pull, I kind of am sort of a, a person, like I have uh, a lot of ephemera from my life. Um, this is. <laughs> This is when I was in art school in 1992. Um, and this was an article that was assigned to us. And this is out of Leonardo um, magazine. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, I've always had a real interest in, um, in art science. And this is an article about data visualization of scientific, sci visualization of scientific data. And I think I wrote here, um, this article will greatly influence the direction and theory of my final project, <laughs> which is a real-time scientific visualization that is representational of mathematical concepts using abstract imagery, which is the scientific <laughs> data. So, uh, and then uh, the professor wrote, uh, data equals abstract imagery, and that's kind of where I find myself now. So it's kind of fun having some of these, these things to look back on and um, just following that path of inquiry of, of how we um, understand science, how we can communicate scientific ideas, and how we can also just kind of uh, have a connection to 
the environment and the natural world around us. Um, I'm going to show a video now um, and uh, that gives uh, some uh, really good background on the project. And um, here we go. you're dealing with the natural world at a data point it's always changing it's always in flux the way that i want to work with technology is just bring the conditions for people to have an experience i don't know what that experience is going to be but i've sort of set the stage as best i can i want there to be some mystery i want there to be some poetic license there One of the things I'm really interested in is industrial design. How do you fabricate these boxes? How do you design all these components to go inside and make them long lasting? And so it's opened up a whole path of inquiry for me of like, what kind of things do I want to make? For the window box project, um, using a hyper-local weather station that will be mounted on the roof of the Vladimir Contemporary. This weather station provides numerous data points. Light levels, wind speed and direction, temperature, barometric pressure, lightning strikes, and all of this data will be the driving force behind the work. I'll set some parameters for how it translates that data, but there'll be a certain extent where it's not in my hands anymore. The weather will be really driving this piece. The skies in New Mexico have always fascinated me. So the sculptural object within the window box is a 3D model of a cloud that was then fabricated and coated in a reflective material. And so when you look into the window box, you're seeing this interplay of light and form that references back to those experiences of viewing light in the skies of New Mexico. We experience environmental conditions all the time. What this piece is really trying to do is to kind of translate some of that into a visual experience that can be a focal point for introspection, for maybe thinking about our place in the world. I'm really interested in that mystery of life. To be within that mystery in my work is part of why I do it. There's like a ton of people to thank on this project, um, but Mountain Mover Media, Kayla did an amazing job on this. Um, Stark Raven Fabrication and the team there really was an amazing support in helping to actually go big on this project and go bigger than I've ever gone. Thank you. I'll turn it over to, to Mira. Okay. Are there a little bit of light, like, oh, yeah. just before I do my presentation? Oh, yeah. Is there a light? If, oh, is there this. an option for, like, uh, dimmer lights? I don't know. <laughs> You guys are probably. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Is it just on or off? Is it on or off? Or there? Okay, we might have to shut them off again, but everybody could just get a little bit of light into their eyes. We've been in the darkness for a little while. So it's great to be here with everybody. Can everybody in the back hear me okay? Because we just decided not to. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. This is Morgan's space, and I feel like you were so generous to invite me in to dialogue. So I really appreciate that. Um, and it's really interesting to, we, we're going to talk after I give a presentation about where things intersect. I mean, we're showing you some very different work but with certain language that you use, I'm like, yes, yes, that's where it connects, but it's just visually so different. Um, and I really, 
you know, this is an auspicious evening being the winter solstice. And I want to take a few minutes to honor that. And so before I turn on the projector again and give us, put us into darkness, um, I want us to just think about for a minute, just you talked about the present moment. So I want us to be really right here, right now, together. And so much of my work is about an embodied practice. And you can really look into the science of that. But I really function in it very intuitively. And more and more, I'm wanting to share not just traditional artist talks where we just look at the screen and listen, but actually share in an experience together. And so thinking about this being the shortest day of the year and the longest night, and I don't know about you all, but the past month with the amount of darkness, it's really put me into a slower, even when my life isn't moving slower, like everything is starting to slow down and it's a much more reflective time. And, you know, I, part of the piece that I'm gonna show you, Sacred Bouquet, is really about re-harnessing our body's relationships with these rhythms and um, with the natural world in an active, in an active way. Um, so I'm going to invite you to, um, and maybe, can we shut the lights off again? Let's mm -hmm. see if I can see. Oh, actually, maybe not. Do you want me to hold it up the flashlight? We're playing with light. It's all about light right now. His piece. What's happening in with the... Do you want no. Okay, okay, let's do this. So I'm not, I'm going to try not to put you guys to sleep, but <laughs> we are going to go into that liminal space for a minute. And if you can, um, I invite you to get, if anyone wants to sit down that sees an open seat or can comfortably lean against the wall, which I see, or sit on the floor, um, just for a couple minutes and just close your eyes gently and give them a rest from sight and from light. And get as comfortable as you can. You can lay your arms in your lap in the most comfortable way and just Tune in to the sounds around you. The stillness, the silence. If you can, hear your breath and feel your chest raising and lowering with your breath. And if you could plant each of your feet firmly on the floor, making sure that both you feel contact with your heels and your toes. And imagine that each of your feet have roots like a tree, many tendrils, large and small, that extend beneath the floor, under the foundation of this building, into the earth's surfaces, intertwining around the soil and the rocks and the minerals and the silt and the sand. And now feel those roots growing, meeting up with the roots of the people sitting nearby you, creating a network of roots that grow and communicate through movement. They are an ancient network, a community like mycelium highly intelligent, sustaining, infinite, a tree of life. And imagine your roots deepening even more, reaching through the different layers of the earth, the crust, 
the mantle, the outer and inner core. Feel the 4,000 miles beneath you to the center of the earth. And now bring your awareness to your hands and imagine that extending from each of your fingers are plants growing, each a different species, your hands making a garden of sentient, intelligent beings, each plant carrying different purposes wisdom, medicines, nourishing our bodies. And if you're comfortable, bring your hands together in front of your heart, holding tenderly this bouquet of sacred plants. And as we enter this wintering season, these roots and plants are laying down, shedding, resting, dreaming, sleeping, moving into a slow, dormant, but quietly alive and introspective time. Everything feels a bit heavier, surrendering to gravity and the restoration and reflection that needs to happen before regrowth. Lay down with them. Let them heal you. Rest. The earth is your first bed. So you can slowly bring your hands down to your lap again just gently opening your eyes and coming back into the space. Happy winter solstice. I hope that was a little restorative to everybody. And that so um, now I'm going to share with you um, it is so dark in here. <laughs> um, give me one second here to get back to the beginning. Okay. I like to write and read a little bit, so don't mind me. I tend to talk, read my writing. Um, so this project, Sacred Bouquet, was completed in 2021, um, but it was recently shown across the street at Form and Concept Gallery in its second iteration. Um, so it feels great to have the opportunity to share it again. So this is where we live in the Ortiz Mountains in Cerritos, New Mexico. It's really the ground beneath my life and work, and we reside quietly and gently here. We are continually learning the vast history of this land. This is the unceded land of Pueblo peoples. Native Americans lived here for up to 10,000 years. And in the past 500 years, there has been a challenging and complex history in this area that includes colonization, enslavement, and many different experiences of gold mining. Sacred Bouquet is a devotion to the nurturing high desert plants and land where we live, and those dear family and friends who carry us through these intense, challenging, and reflective times, keeping in mind that this was 2021, so this was right in the midst of the pandemic when this was made. Um, this piece was generously commissioned by Bridge Projects in Los Angeles, and um, it was part of an exhibition called We Are All Guests Here, 
which invited seven artists to make new commissions on the Jewish holiday of Sukkot. What else can you offer the earth which has everything? What else can you give but something of yourself? A homemade ceremony, a ceremony that makes home. A beautiful quote that really embodies this project from Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. So close family and friends gathered on a quiet morning at our home in the Ortiz Mountains. Together we participated in a joyous, slow, quiet, walking movement meditation on a long dirt road in this high desert landscape. During the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, religious Jewish people build a temporary structure outside to eat and sometimes to live in for a week each fall. It is a celebration of the harvest and each day a plant bundle of four particular species native to the Middle East is shaken in the four directions and above and below. I chose to recreate this ritual in relationship to the land where I live now and in, in, with the community of the people that live closest to me. So using four native high desert plants as, um, as the bouquet native to our land and that includes yucca, pinion, juniper, and prickly pear. Each person was holding a handmade sacred bouquet made specifically for them of these four plants. Each plant honors a part of the body, the heart, the spine, the eyes, and the lips, connection to the land and connection to each other. As we walked, we periodically waved the bouquets in specific movements in the four directions as well as above and below, which I mentioned is the traditional way of doing it. And after each movement, we brought the bouquet towards our hearts, sealing the action. We walked in silence along our mile long dirt road with my husband playing a repetitive song on the guitar as we walked, grounding our movements. Every three minutes, we stopped to wave our bouquets in the four directions and above and below. This ritual symbolizes the rejoicing of the harvest, the body, and the gifts of these from the higher power. At the end of the two-hour pilgrimage, we lay down on some bedsheet cloths in the road and rested in the hot sun. We came together to honor the important reciprocity of comfort, intimacy, and care, and laughter everyone provided for each other, a wedding of sorts celebrating the commitments we made to each other during challenging, mournful times. We felt safe in the elements together. We felt the healing properties of the plant beings around us. We have been and we are on a pilgrimage together. So this ceremony was encapsulated in this four channel video installation. Um, it was filmed and edited by dear friends of mine, Rachel Schumann and David Sampliner, and it was made into a room-like experience that's supposed to resemble the sukkah walls of what you would be in during Sukkot, during the holiday of Sukkot. And then there is um, a sound bath piece accompanying it so that you can sit in the space and really feel a part of the ceremony. And each screen represents a different direction, a different plant, a different part of the body. And the sound piece was composed by my husband and it just really, you sit on these pillows and it just permeates your experience. The ins installation space is like an embrace it's like a sacred space, one of the four wild sukkah, the four directions, the four plant species, the four parts of the body. It's a sanctuary for pause and healing and embodied energy.
And each time it's installed, it really has a little bit different of a feel. This was this was in Los Angeles. These images in in form and concept, the space was smaller, and so it became much more intimate, which was really beautiful too. Just kind of having it adapt to the architecture of the space. So while it was at form and concept, I was able to kind of add a next layer to the experience, and I held some sensory workshops where people could come and we could actually really experience a sound bath and lay in the space and uh, have some experiences with the different four different plant species. So this was the setup for that. And now I'm just gonna play you just a clip of one of the screens, just a couple minutes. So you can <laughs> so thank you all for listening and being here and thanks again Great. So, does thank you so much for sharing that oh. that work and the music. I, I just that sound bath is so inviting and restful and welcoming. Thank really, you. Really enjoy thank that. You. And um, so we um, just gonna pull up some notes here. We. Um, we want to ask each other some questions yeah. because I think we, uh, you know, I think we recognize in each other's work different um, crossovers in different ways that are not always apparent on the surface. And so, um, let me just pull this up here real quick. Um, well, one thing that I thought was. Uh, um, <coughs> Interesting is that the idea of sleep. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's where we're going to start, but that that that, that uh, we each have done work um, around um, sleep and um, sort of uh, understanding how sleep operates. You want to talk about your project that the um, the print or the um, photographic piece? Yeah. Um, 
I think since the beginning of my art career, I've explored sleep and rest in different ways. And one of, and usually in some way, but somewhere around like the interior environment of our home in combination with the exterior environment of the land. And so I've done large scale installations. I did one in which it was um, photo, a photographic collage, photographs of my husband and I's bedding, um, where I take the photograph and then I cut out just the comforter form and I collage those together and I made it in a silhouette of the Ortiz Mountains where we live. And it was like, I don't know, 40 feet long. And um, so, you know, how, what is that relationship between consciousness and materiality? And that's something, you did a piece do you want to talk about your piece yeah, about yeah. sleep? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sleep. Uh, it's, it's. Uh, so I, I did a light, a, sort of a, a light box piece that's not, um, it's not really one of the Lumia pieces, but it's more of a data visualization project where, um, I took um, sleep data. Um, I have sleep apnea, and I sleep with a CPAP machine, and I've, you know, been living with this thing for a long time. And one day I was, I was just. Thinking about it, it's you know this this you're kind of going in between uh, a sleep state and a wake state when you're asleep, and it's this kind of um, this this back and forth sort of waking up moment. And I so I was able to kind of capture that data and turn it into um, uh, a data visualization, and kind of took I took a year's worth of sleep data and um, turned that into uh, this. Uh, this piece where there's a kind of circular motif that um, is larger when there's more sleep and smaller when there's less sleep and it became this kind of way for me to understand my own patterns and and think about um, how you know how consciousness you know um, between waking and sleeping states is happens you know and so it was just a, a way to kind of uh, you know if, look at that um, over that long period of time and really pull out patterns or look at what's really happening there. And that, mm -hmm. and that was, I think, a, a really interesting, um, you know, way to think about it because we, you know, we, we don't always think about it in those longer, longer time scales. Um, I love that connection between the aperture and the sleeping and waking state, like the movement of our eye, and rapid yeah. eye movement, yeah. it makes, makes so much sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And there is this exploration of the liminal in that it's like, it's not you're asleep or you're awake. There's so many in-between states that we're learning. Scientists are learning so much more about, but it's still very much a mystery. Like a, what of different, you know, what is really happening at different types of sleep and why we need a certain amount of sleep and um, what is happening when our sleep is disrupted. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, I think, by looking at it over those time scales, there's periods where it would drop down, you know, and like those were like times when I when I wasn't getting a lot of sleep or something, and and just the importance of getting good sleep is like very important, but it's not something where we always kind of put in the foreground. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so. We're thinking about that. Yeah, that's one of the unseen territories. The unseen. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the unseen, I think, is something really interesting that um, that we both. You know, this kind of more spiritual modes that, that you're exploring and the, um, uh, the connection to the, the landscape and th things along those lines. Um, the unseen is like a very uh, powerful domain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you just made me think of when they were working on the catalog for the, um, the show that Sacred Bouquet was in, someone asked me the question, oh, are you interested in people like moving around inside that four screens, like having some kind of, you know, dance experience or movement meditation? And my response to that question was actually like I was imagining something so subtle, where it's almost like the sound and the experience of watching this ceremony was like moving the water within your body, mm. you know, being 70% water, like we are so impacted. So I was imagining it like on a super subtle level, which I think connects mm -hmm. to the unseen, is just what is happening when the water, when you sit still and you experience, like you have 
a sound piece that sound moves the water within your body and it's like massaging your organs and your internal mm -hmm. so I mean it, it I like that range of thinking about the unseen like we can't see exactly that that massage is happening but it is I feel that way about um, about light too like yeah. the way like light enters enters your your eyes and you know is I mean you are seeing but there's also there's just like a very physiological thing happening you know and where does it go yeah. right where does the light go once it <laughs> enters into you you know it's um, which is always a, something that I've thought about um, and but then it's the experience you know it's it's like just the, the that, that inner side that mm -hmm. um, is a response to, to the visual mm -hmm. um, but it's it's that inner domain of when light becomes a thought or, or something mm -hmm. along those lines mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that makes me also think about just talking. I think you went back to your art school experience, mm -hmm. and I go back to like one of my favorite classes in undergraduate was a sensation and perception class in mm -hmm. psychology. And I still have the textbook today, and I like love to pick it up and read it. But the studies of perception, the studies of sensation are whole fields in themselves. I mean, they're now saying like, we have way more than the five senses. There's like mm -hmm. up to like 18 senses. If you take into, con you know, if you really explore sensation and perception, again, those are like unseen realms of our body's experiences in our minds. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's also like, um, uh, it's like for me, like with, like with the piece reflection point here, the, um, thinking of the unseen too is like the elements, right? And like we, we see the effects of the wind, but we never actually see the wind, right? And so like those mm -hmm. areas I think are, are really interesting and in how to translate those into more of an experience mm -hmm. that, that so you can interpret them in different ways and, and, uh, and, and have those sensations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really excited to go outside with after yeah. the talk because I just, that idea of how we might have perceived that window space walking in when you can mm -hmm. only very subtly see and then how that just the change in the light outside is like making an expanded perceptual experience mm -hmm. you know and it's it's so obvious but then also like it takes a minute to like slow down and really think about what is occurring that it's not just just the data but it's actually the light the light, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and your position and your whatever, position, yeah. yeah, exactly. The difference, yeah, yeah. Um, there was so there was a, a crossover that I wanted to kind of bring up and kind of um, uh, kind of on that sensation and perception kind of um, idea, um, and it's I think related back to some of your sleep work as well but um, uh, fabric I think fabric and sort of the tactile quality of things is something that um, is an interest I mean I generally work digitally but um, uh, I did a piece several years ago that was a sort of emulation of fabric and getting lost in the folds of drapery mm -hmm. and that sort of um, you know just very uh, I don't know, it's just sort of central experience of um, how light and material interact. Mm -hmm. And I think your sleep piece deals with some of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting that I am so drawn to the sensual qualities of a textile or a bedding, the textures, the feel, all of the memories associated with it, the experience of sleep. But somehow, like, I do work with textiles sometimes, but the photography of the textiles was much more interesting in the way mm -hmm. that you're saying, like the video of this materiality allows, it reveals like what I call like a hidden language yeah. of the material that you can't see in the material itself. We almost have too many experiences with it, too many associations, but somehow the photography allows you to step back and see this material 
and suddenly all this like dreamlike imagery is coming out in the folds of the fabric and you know it's it's just really interesting I think when I watched that video piece I was like yes you know I mean suddenly you're seeing like the interaction of the light with the textile um, the interaction of movement in a space with the textile you know um, so super exciting untapped but I, I love that once well, that you know it's the um a sort of moment like in Renaissance painting with the drapery it's this moment for to get kind of lost in abstraction when within very fixed uh, kind of imagery mm -hmm. you know and I think that's just such an exciting sort of space mm -hmm. to, to be working in mm -hmm. it's really, really interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we had some other topics too the environment yeah. I think is an interesting an interesting one um, yeah thinking about, um, uh, you know, just paying attention, you know, I think that's for me, like with this piece is, you know, I think we, um, we don't pay a lot of attention to, 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 uh, to, um, to what's happening around us. And so, you know, I think one of the things that I wanted to explore with this piece is just, you know, to have um, a moment to, um, sit with this abstract representation of what's happening, you know, mm -hmm. and, and going back and visiting it over time might reveal new things or new ways of, of thinking about our place here. Um, when I was going through some, some of my, my archive stuff, I also found um, uh, a paper I wrote on um, Critical Path by Buckminster Fuller, you know, and where he really, you know, laid out some, you know, very stark terms of constant energy income, you know, and then uh, energy savings and kind of really setting up, you know, how uh, how we here on, you know, uh, Spaceship Earth, right, um, uh, are using our savings and not this kind of constant energy income that we have around us. And that's always just really stuck with me. And there was an urgency back then, and that was, you know, now in the 90s, you know, that I felt but we're still in that same conversation, mm -hmm. I feel like. Mm -hmm. And you know, what are uh, you know what are the things that we should be paying attention to? You know, the changing weather, the changing patterns, the um, and how we fit into all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like one of the things that I hope for, I think maybe subconsciously originally on that long walk of a mile down a road and a mile back was that there was some kind of rewiring happening, that we would literally rewire our relationship to the land there, to the history, to our experience, create an experience in that land that we've never had before that would make us be in more relationship to it and in a new way. And the same thing with actually physically holding those plants for two hours. like. We were not only, we were smelling them, we were feeling them. We were, you know, you probably after two hours in the hot sun were imagining like taking a bite out of one of them for <laughs> some refreshment, you know, like there is a rewiring that I feel like that needs to happen. It can happen in different ways, but in that rewiring, I feel like then energy is moving in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So like just the two minutes we spent imagining like roots under our feet like what does that how does that rewire us you know to go out and walk or to how does it rewire us every time we put our feet on the concrete and understand like what is happening underneath the concrete mm. you know so um i do think sometimes we just need to like do new things to re there's a lot of reconnection um there's a lot of deeper understanding that i think has to come from that yeah yeah and um, it is a redirection of energy, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah that's I, a great one. And I think it's like also, I think something that, you know, it's also a reevaluation of like materials and like what kinds of materials we use. And that's something that, that I've been thinking a lot about in, you know, making things. It's just mm -hmm. like using materials to make things is um, sometimes, I think, uh, in conflict with like what we should maybe be doing and mm -hmm. how we should be 
be working. And so like, you know, ideas of upcycling or reusing things is always something that's interested me a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and, and um, I think something that I've, is a constant reminder as I'm making new things is, you know, do you, what do I, what am I using to make it? Do I really need to make it out of that material or can I make it out of something that has been discarded and would wind up in a landfill, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. When I, I lived in um, New Zealand for um, several years, I, I taught at a, a school there and um, did a project. Um, uh, they set up these shipping containers for people to do pop-up art installations and um, I collaborated with someone on a, a piece where we collected uh, plastic bags. Um, I had um, this experience where I was driving up to the dump through the in Wellington, New Zealand, through the mountains, and it was like really beautiful, and then you turn a corner, and it's just like littered with plastic bags that have blown off the dump, you know? And so, you know, so they kind of really got into this discussion of like the usage of plastic bags. Why, do, what are they used for? Just going like a very short distance. And so we took those and um, upcycled them to make projection screens out of. Awesome. And, and, uh, and then we interviewed people about their relationship to plastic bags and what they thought of plastic bags. And it became this really great dialogue where we were out in the public space talking to people, doing workshops where we were sewing reusable bags out of plastic bags. <laughs> and so that spirit is something that, uh, you know, this is, this is years ago now, but it's um, something that's really stuck with me and, yeah. and something that I think is really important just to think about. It's like yeah. how we use materials and yeah. why we use materials. Yeah, you have that experience once, and then you'll never look at a bag in the same way or take it for granted, yeah. or, you know, it, all it takes is one experience, which an experience could be like 10 seconds, mm -hmm. you know, or experience could be a day, or, and that has a whole potential to shift. It doesn't necessarily have to be a long experience, which I think sometimes people think that, but it's really happening in our minds, right. more so than ever, than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, that made me, it, you know, I was so grateful to be asked to commission a piece for this show. And it's, because it's not often that you just get a phone call and get asked, get given an amount of money and, you know. But, the, and I'm walking, I do a daily walk up and down this road and I'm just thinking, what am I going to do, you know? What uh -huh. And it did cross my mind, like I had a vision of this ceremony. I didn't have a vision of a four channel video <laughs> installation <laughs> and I just was like how can this ceremony sit in the gallery you know like how can it how can the meaning and purpose and and soulfulness of it be captured in a physical thing and then there was a point of frustration at a certain point like why do I have to even do anything else mm -hmm. you know why can't I just do the ceremony right. but then we can't share it right so there's there is this line of just like we we talked about like the minimal physicality that we could do to kind of capture it. And it was in my first time working in new media, which is also really exciting because it it does open up this channel to to communicate some of these unseen realms. Hmm. You know, to me the the it was important that the video wasn't just documentation of the ceremony but that it actually recreated a new experience where the people in it felt like they were participating in the ceremony again in some way. Um, but yeah, I was concerned about the materiality and the impact of it because it didn't seem to jive with the spirit of the initial idea. Right. But I think it ended up d resolving it and it will get reused over and over again. It can become many different things. But I do like that immateriality of of new media, some new media, not all well, in video. And it's, it's like that ephemeral experience of being there with, you know, doing uh, the ritual with your, your friends and, and yeah, how do you recreate that? Or mm -hmm. how do you kind of turn that into a space that can be re-experienced and mm -hmm. still maintain some of that quality? Mm -hmm. It's a big challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Do you ever uh, anticipate doing that um, again in a different way like physically like like reenacting it that piece in any way good question um i think i imagine just coming up with some other different kind of ritual mm. or a ceremony yeah. to me that was like you're talking about the present moment right. that was really of that time right. it was 2021 it was july 
we all had just gotten the beginnings of vaccinations or not, you know, it was, we were starting to socialize a little bit more again. And so I don't know that I, that time and space mm -hmm. is very important. Right. Yeah. And especially with, with ritual, but definitely I feel like more and more I would like ritual and ceremony to be an active part of my practice. Like it seems like a natural extension. Sure. Yeah. Can we open up a question? Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone have any, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Before I forget. <laughs> um, so when you went from uh, using music as a tool for your visualization to weather data, yeah. how did it change? Like do you notice It was very different. I mean it was more mm -hmm. like um, uh, you know the the patterns of music were very different from the kind of data that I was getting from the weather sensor. But it just allowed me to, I guess it kind of created a, um, almost like a time-lapse situation where the data is moving very rapidly, right? So if you were- like color-wise, like how oh, that? Yeah. Mean, yeah, the visual effect of it, like as an abstraction. <laughs> so like, like something I might do with music is like take a frequency range and map that to color. Right, and so when I'm working with weather data, like um, I'll take temperature and map that to a color range. So it would kind of allow me to just kind of experiment with things and see what would happen when with those color palettes and how they might shift. And I could kind of see those values much quicker than I might with changing temperature. So it, it was sort of a way to sort of just iterate, you know. It's and a different color palette. Well, uh, it just depends on how you scale. Scale. It's all about scaling the data in different ways, you know. So, um, the yeah, color palette. Took stills of each one. Like, would they look that much different? Um, yeah, I think they would. I think they would. I mean, especially because the the materials were all very different as well. You know, the reflective materials were different. The, a lot of the conditions were were different. But it's more about just having an input to. Um, work with the generative um, animations and start to start to figure out what works and what doesn't. So there may be moments that that could look similar, right? But there's a lot of other parameters that... that so it has your thumb print on Yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh, yeah. Follow-up question to that. Um, when you were... Coming up with the music for that piece, I think it's between my. Did you think about, am I composing this music to be seen as opposed to be heard? And follow up to that, what would it be to compose music that's not going to be heard, but it's only going to be seen? That's a really interesting question. Um, so, uh, yeah, the music that in that particular clip or like when I'm in my studio is not necessarily meant to be heard. <laughs> you know, it's sort of more just like um, experimenting, playing, um, trying things out, um, having something that I can quickly manipulate. That's one thing I like about working with music is I can quickly um, change the dynamics. I can change the patterns and rhythms. Um, and I really like the idea of music that isn't heard, that is translated into individual. Um, and I think that's a really interesting area to explore. Um, I'm trying to th I, there's something that I've done similar to that, um, but it's, uh, I'm blanking on it right now. But thanks. What about going the other way? Uh, light and music. Well, that's, so uh, that's, uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, when I was in graduate school, I took a class that was all about, um, it's called New Interfaces for Musical Expression. And it was, um, and it's weird because I made a light box. And so <laughs> I've, I've been making light boxes in different ways, but I, I did a project there where I had um, this box with four different quadrants and I had like LEDs in there and little video cameras. And so, I was actually like using uh, computer vision to see what's happening with the LEDs and that was controlling a musical output. So I've kind of experimented with that and that's I think really exciting and interesting way of 
generating sound is mm -hmm. from like a visual element mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. so I've kind of played in that area uh, we, yeah yeah yeah. Um, your work evokes aurora borealis to me. Mm -hmm. My question is, have you ever seen a real aurora borealis? I have never seen one, but um, I did, uh, I worked on a project that's at the biopark in Albuquerque that takes um, the uh, aurora australis in the southern hemisphere, mm -hmm. uh, takes the NOAA space weather data and re and run it, um, it, creating a light installation based on that data of where the solar winds are coming from to try and emulate um, a sort of experience that's similar to that. But I, I would love to, to go and see an aurora at some point and just that idea of the um, excited gases creating this kind of visual is, is fascinating. Okay. Yeah, I, I back in the seventies we saw some very intense auroras uh, in Spokane, Washington. And one interesting thing was that they created the internal sensation of a sound. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any physical thing going on, but for sure, you know, some kind of very low frequency something or other. Mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Um Okay. I uh, so that weather station. Did you have to run like a bunch of wires down to no. the? How is it communicating? Uh, it's wireless, oh. so it's um, connected to Wi-Fi network, and it, it um, yeah. So it's all it's all it's so it's solar powered, so it has a little battery on it, um, and it just charge. It's you know south facing, and so it just is always charging and and uh, communicating. It <coughs> sends data these packets of data every minute. So it's fairly um, fast. And it was really important for me to have like that hyper local weather because you can get, you know, weather from the airport, you know, but just that idea of it being right where you are was important to, to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Hi, um, I was really struck by how many um, mediums we were working across with like knowledge of industrial design, woodwork, and music, light, and generative animation. So I guess my question was more learning um, niche. Like, how do you develop, what's your approach to developing uh, so many competencies across, like, multiple dimensions? Um, well, I've been a teacher for a long time, and, and that, that, that's, that's like a great way to learn things is by being a teacher and I was also just a lifelong learner also I just I'm always um, kind of just just kind of exploring new things um, I don't know it's like you know I did wood shop in high school <laughs> and like some of those things stuck with me you know and then uh, and then you know so I kind of do what I can myself and get as far as I can and then you know, there's times when I have to like bring folks in to help me, like especially, you know, going big on this project. It's like I could never have done any of that like myself. So I kind of work on like smaller scales. Um, I took a class this semester in music production because I've kind of been making music for a long time, but like, you know, just like learn new software and try something new out. Um, so I think just that attitude of like being a lifelong learner is just part of um, how I approach teaching when I when I teach and how I approach things. Uh, go in the back, Callie. Um, can both of you talk a little bit about what you do when you hit roadblocks and challenges in your creative process and how you get past the like step further into the unknown? <laughs> 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 I guess like any challenge in life, one of the things, exercises that I do is I lay down, surprisingly, <laughs> and I really ask myself, because I do believe there's a different knowledge when our, we're in a horizontal position than when we're in a vertical position. So a vertical position of your body really emphasizes the intellect and the head. But when you're laying flat, all parts of your body are on equal ground. So I feel like the wisdom is like 
more wide encompassing. This is just my personal philosophy. Um, so yeah, I just take five minutes and I lay down and I do that periodically until I get like the answer. I ask the question, like what do I need to work through this or resolve this or, you know, and it usually comes. But I do, um, you know, that's just a very tangible exercise but I, I think it's such a natural part of the process that I'm glad you asked about it because I think everything looks so glamorous when it gets to the museum or the gallery and people have no idea. Like it's intense, especially when you choose to work in a new medium, you know, and it's great to have community at that moment and surround yourself with people who might be able to supplement your knowledge in, some, in one way or another. Like, um, that was the beautiful thing about that commission is that they really offered up. I said, I have this idea, you know, like, can somebody help me? I don't do video work. You know, I want to do video work for the first time, you know. And so there is a little bit of um, humbleness that has to come where you just really just need to ask for help, you know, whether it's with, within yourself or from other people that you know. That's my thought. I, I just yeah, my kind of thought on that is like um, patience, like patience with others, um, patience with myself, which is I think something that is just a lifelong learned <laughs> learning thing to, to go through, you know, because the challenges, they can sometimes seem like insurmountable and, and, and some of them are, are, are internal, some of them are external. And, you know, I think just um, being patient is the way that I've, found to get through that, you know, is to try not to give myself a hard time when those challenges come yeah. up and then to just, uh, yeah, and, and, to, and to reach out for support and get people that, um, that, uh, that are on my team and that always helps a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, with the four screens that you created and the speech had sound, how did you manipulate that? How did they take, um, did they go in some kind of a progression? Um, the screens projected different videos, but the sound was just one sound piece created for the whole space. I have a question about the sacred juniper plant. Um, I've lived in New Mexico for about 10 years now, and for the last year I became severely allergic to it. <laughs> and I have to leave the state because my eyes it's holding up. What part of the body is the juniper plant um, connected to? Well, this, there's a little poetics in that <laughs> um, because in the Jewish tradition, the specific Middle Eastern plants that are used in that bouquet are associated with a different part of the body in the mystical traditions. Um, so I kind of came up with my own part of the body. Like I took the parts of the body that were in the traditional way and then I had, I assigned them. So the spine was the yucca, which to me that just made complete sense. The heart was the prickly pear. Sorry, just, so the, oh yeah, no, this is, this is my own poetic interpretation, but the juniper um, berries were um, the mouth. Um, but I hear you on the allergies. <laughs> I, I, it, it's a very real thing, and I do think if you come here from another place, and you haven't been, it takes about eight years to get it. Well, I didn't have anything my first five years, but the second five years, and still now, I'm, you know, I. Um, but I do. It reminds me that I'm not from here in a way and that I need to like spend a lot of time to really allow my body to adapt. That's more than you asked for, but. <laughs> so how do you see your, your work in the uh, field of science? That's a good question. You know, Andrea would always be wanting to me to come to um, she does it too. the group and I, I guess I just don't compartmentalize the disciplines in the way that I think. And um, so I really, if I'm gonna, if you're gonna talk about biology, I mean, obviously talking about plants, land, the body, you're talking about 
biology, you're also talking about physics. You know, you're talking about energy fields that we're trying to access and understand. So I'm not, that's not my background. Because you're not research-based. No, I'm, I mean, well, I'm research-based in a different form of research. And I really feel it's really important to honor different types of research. So I'm not academic research, but I would call it like really much more intuitive, instinctual research which is just as valid, and I want it to be more and more valid in the culture that we live in. So um, I just, I really, language is very specific, but we, I'm like trying to re-integrate, and I do feel that there's a lot of science in the underpinning of everything that we do. So um, it's, we're talking more about life experience, and, and it's just about f focusing in different ways. On that experience. That's my broad interpretation. I've got two questions. They're very different from each other. Is, is, can I take, can I have two questions? Sure. That are very different. Thank you. Um, so, Mira, I was really taken by something that you said about uh, doing something new by connecting to the old and this idea of like parade and ceremony and Morgan, uh, what you've done by connecting to something that's like pre human and synthesizing it through these like hard edges and technology. Um, and even Mira's work having those like hard edges and the, the, uh, the mystic adaptation. Um, so I was just, I, I guess I was just wondering like what, what tickles your brain? What fascinates you about the old or the pre-human and, um, or even like the, the early human in, um, in the way that Mira has talked about the, the earth being our first bed. Um, the, things, the things that we inherently know, but don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's like we, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, I don't know, for some reason I've, I like uh, got sort of fixated on like um, the early 20s, you know, as like a, a, peer, a time period of like of interest and um, but that I think referenced back further still and I think looking at kind of like um, you know artifacts and and um, and records of how humans have understood the environment I think is really interesting and the connection to the stars and the movement of of the universe is something that's a really like shared human experience, I think. And so I think there's just a fascination I have with that. And I'm not directly exploring that in the work I do, but there is an aspect to it that is similar to like staring into a fire, you know? And there's something very human about that. And, um, you know, I think it's like recreating those kind of experiences in a way that um, are not attached to language necessarily, but are a way that we um, experience. So I don't know. And like, you know, I'm, I'm uh, Welsh and Croatian uh, heritage and just like, you know, looking at, um, you know, the, the stone monuments, you know, um, in, uh, in, in, in the Wales area and, and that part of the world are just something that's always been um, really fascinating to me and seeing, just wondering what was happening there you know, and how people are interacting with nature and shaping nature for some kind of reason. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, I, like, I like thinking about this a lot. I just, I think I often reference this idea that how come I know some things, but it's not through academic research? Mm -hmm. It's, it's remarkable. And I do believe on a cellular level, like we're learning so much about somatics in this time to balance out technology, you know, um, that our body has memory from a lot longer than our lifetime. And so I'm really trying to like be open to getting knowledge in a different kind of way. 
and through the body and through the land. Um, and it's, it's contrary to maybe the past four generations of my family, but before then, I think they probably were a lot more tuned in to that. And so um, it is interesting as people are exploring their genealogy um, a lot more, like what we do with that information, you know, how we try and understand what it was like for our ancestors at different times and what their culture was like, what the context was for for and how that lives within us. Like it's much more of a, a continuum and a spiral, so to speak, than we like to think of beginning is beginnings and ends. Oh, did you have a second question? I did, I did have a second question. I'm sorry. Is that okay? It's an aesthetic question. It's a lot. It's a lot less heady. You guys both like uh, soft round things. <laughs> um, Mira, I noticed your like, like weird like belly button um, type fleshy pillows in the installation. And um, Morgan, like you and I have spent a lot of time together inside the window, and uh, you brought that like cloud in and wrapped in mylar and you were like oh it looks kind of like a ufo and it's also like a cloud and um and i think i thinking about that and um your your biopark piece and, and the things that live inside of those enclosures that, that you've created that th those round soft edges how important is softness in the work um yeah, I think it's important. It's kind of like, it's, it's also like tied in with like the idea of diffusion, you know, and that kind of, um, that softening of hard edges, right? And the kind of, the, uh, you know, um, yeah, just kind of somehow finding a gradient between opposites, you know? And so softness is really important because it is that manifested in material, you know? And I think that's something that's really important. I think we, find ourselves in like really polarized times, you know? And so I think having that degree of softness and those layers in there of, of viewing is, is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think of like permeability and porousness, mm -hmm. like that's something like a textile has that, and a body has. And like, I imagine that every person that sits on that cushion after the person before them like maybe somehow their experience is being passed on through that cushion, you know? It's like there is a lot more, I mean, their, their hair, their DNA might not be resting on that pillow or um, some other germs or, you know, so there's just, I think that flexibility and, um, and sensuality is very important part of softness. Another question? Uh, relating to what you said earlier, does the idea of past life uh, come to you or is it familiar? Because when you were speaking, you sort of evoked people back to me. Yeah, um, I haven't used that terminology like in my own experience. I've certainly read about some really epic past life experiences that people have. And I'm, re I'm really drawn to other realms, like other realms of accessing. So I, I just think, um, I'm trying to fine tune my own experience of accessing other realms. And it may not necessarily be a past life of mine, but it could be a past life of a uh, ancestor of mine or an experience of an ancestor of mine, or a, um, a lived experience within a particular environment that maybe happened at another time that we're able to feel when we walk into a space. It's like when you go into someone's house or you, if you're, if you're shopping for houses and you walk into a house and you get a feeling what is that? You know, how can we learn more about that? 
um, that, so it's in the realm of past lives, but it can manifest in a lot of, a lot of different ways, I think. Where was that show in LA? Bridge Projects, which is a fairly, well, the space is no longer there. They lived, they lived for three years in this beautiful warehouse space, and their, their focus was the intersection of contemporary art and spirituality, which was really unique. And I was really sad that the space, they're just now supporting museum exhibitions around those themes instead of having their own space. But it was amazing, and they did like mm -hmm. some incredible shows in that three years. Bridge. Bridge projects. Any other questions? All right, cool. Well, um, I think we can kind of wrap up and go outside yeah. and see your piece. Well, and, and I, I'd really like to thank um, the New Mexico Museum of Art for their support in this project. Um, the team here has just really been amazing to work with and accommodating and a lot of thanks and to everyone that's helped out on the project, a huge thank you to all of you. Um, and um, yeah, we can go outside and take a look at it. It is best viewed at night. There is an inside portion that during the day, um, you can see during, during the day, um, but it is really oriented for um, evening viewing. So um, we can all go out there and, and take a look. Thank you all for, for coming and asking questions. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for joining me here.